health issues on this program before. Uh, and when we do, I always say thank you because very, very personal stuff. And for those of you who do share your stories, it very much helps other people. Well, Lynn Fogarty is one such person brave enough to talk about her mental illness. She battled with the highs and lows of bipolar for years. And she's written a book about this, which you'll hear about in this interview. She has started by telling me about when she was first diagnosed bipolar. I was diagnosed in 2006, but looking back, I've had the condition from about age 13. What are your early memories of it? Uh, the very earliest memories didn't have a name. It was just knowing you were different, not understanding why. Um, physically, there was a lot of tiredness. There was a lot of concentration issues, some memory issues, but I just thought, Everybody must be like this. And did you get profoundly down? Did you have big highs and lows as a child? Uh, my first piece of writing on the issue of mental illness was done at 13, and it was called Suicide. And that literally was written at a time following a suicidal crisis. By that I mean that I came within five or ten minutes of actually following through, not that I did make an attempt, but I was in crisis. What was in your head at the time? Why did you want to end your life? It's a long time ago, and each crisis is different, so it's hard to recall that specific one, but uh, isolation, like being alone in the middle of your own life, surrounded by people but not having a voice to say what it is that's on the inside of your head, you knowing that you're loved but having so much pain in your life that even though you want to live, you can't find a way to live. And was the pain... Could you relate the pain to anything specific, or was the pain in your head real for you, but no actual reason? At no time in any of my crisis was there a specific trigger. It just occurred. The depression came of its own accord, it stayed, it grew, and I ended up in that place. Can you describe the place? Can you describe what it's like when you're... Uh, in a loop? Um, it, for me, can hit very quickly. Um, sometimes it comes gradually, but when it comes quickly, it's much more intense, more difficult to deal with. And you feel like you're in the bottom of a dark, dark pit. And you can see the light, and you can see the world, but it's just beyond you to climb out of the pit. You know it's there, but you just can't reach it. You're not part of it. And all you want in the early stages for someone to climb down and sit with you. You don't want anybody to fix you. You don't want them to cure you. You don't want you to be told that it's all going to be okay and then leave and let you be on your own. You just want them to sit and be with you and talk and listen if need be. That's it. Um, then it gets darker. Then you don't want anybody around you. You've given up completely and you just want to let the darkness close in. You want the light to disappear. And that's it. You have been self-harming. Yes, it is a coping tool, yeah. Unfortunately, I acknowledge it is a self-destructive one, but I use it as a coping tool. What have you been doing? Uh, cuts, burns, scratches. Burning yourself? Yeah. Cutting yourself? Mm -hmm. Now, there are many degrees to this. It's it's not necessarily as severe as many others you may have heard of, but I have done these things, yeah. When you go to burn your own skin, what's in your head? Release. It's like it's a pressure valve. That just for a brief moment, all the pain and the confusion and the darkness and the intensity, and it all just goes away. You left with scars? Yeah. Because for people who don't suffer, they will find it hard to understand that we've got, we've all got that instinct to protect ourselves, don't we? And to, you know, if we're in danger, we push danger away from us. Mm -hmm. And you were hurting yourself. Yeah, it's, it's strange for me because I can identify it and logically I can look at it just as anyone else would and I can see that it is self-destructive. At the time when you do it, it is your only option. It is the one sure thing that you know will fix the situation. So you've been suffering.
suffering from from this from you were a child. And by the way, I admire you, and I mean that. I admire you for talking out about uh, mental illness. I think it will help a lot of people. Uh, I I think there is a real attempt over recent years to break the stigma of, of mental illness. And uh, thanks to people like like you, it's profoundly personal, though, isn't it? When mm -hmm. you say, when you say out loud, you know you had three suicide attempts. So when you say out loud that you tried to, to kill yourself three times? Well, I should say I did actually try to kill myself. I came within five or ten minutes of that action. Uh, I still call them suicidal crisis because it's, those five or ten minutes are the most intense. And um, there's just no other word. Crisis is all I can describe it as. But, yes, I've been there actually five times now in my life. Can you apply logic to it? You don't want to die. You just can't find a way to live that has no pain in it. Then you could be surrounded by the most loving family and the most wonderful support, but in that dark moment, you're on your own. And what do you need at that stage, looking back on it now? What's the best thing to get at that stage? Someone to listen. Because there's so much intensity and confusion going on in your mind. And if you can find a way of expressing that, the situation quite often will change and your perspective will change. Now that's, again, where the book and all came from because I used writing as my way of expression. And a lot of times, by putting those thoughts on paper, I avoided going into crisis. But when I've been in crisis, um, I have used helplines and use them to be a signboard for my thoughts. So talking helps? Absolutely, for me it did. Uh, and l if the other person will listen, because sometimes there's a temptation for people to jump in and immediately try and fix you. And that's not what you need. You need someone to listen. You were in a, a psychiatric ward at one stage. That's right, yes. I went in for three days observation, which turned into four weeks. What's it like in one of those wards? Um, I have nothing to compare it to other than the television. And I can tell you all that negative stuff I've seen on TV is a lie <laughs> in, my, in my experience. Uh, it was good. The environment was clean and comfortable. The staff were friendly and helpful. The other patients were very supportive. It wasn't a negative experience for me. It really was a positive one. I know there are bad circumstances in all parts of life, but I haven't been touched by them. And what, what state were you in when you attended the last hospital? In such a state that I can't accurately recall it. Um, I went in voluntarily. I knew where I was and everything, but I wasn't thinking clearly. There was a lot of confusion. Um, people would introduce themselves. You wouldn't remember the names. They would show you how to get somewhere and you wouldn't remember how to get there. It was all just a blur. And then towards the middle of the time, things started to make a little more sense. I began to calm down and it was better. And that's when you were diagnosed mm -hmm. bipolar? Yeah. Which means what? Okay, I'm going to keep this as simple as I can because um, the clinical version would take us an hour. Being bipolar means that you have swings of mood that are much more intense and last much longer than the general population. Bipolar 1, you will swing from a very, very deep depression right through to a full-blown mania and have periods of stability in between. You might have anxiety issues and you might have psychosis as well. Bipolar 2, which is what I have, you still get the really deep lows, you still get the periods of stability, but you don't go just as high. So mine would be called hypomania. Cyclothymia is similar to those, but scaled down. The extremes just close in. They're not just as bad. And rapid cycling is if you have the symptoms of bipolar 1 or 2, but you get four or more distinct episodes in one year. And with the bipolar, you're bipolar 2. two. And, and, and you have certain degrees of highs and lows. Mm -hmm. Are the highs really enjoyable? If the lows are really bad, are the highs really, really great? Yes. Um, we may complain at times of being too agitated, too, too stimulated, not being able to sleep. But truthfully, 
We love them. And we would take them back in a heartbeat. The maids do take it from you. They're designed to pull the extremes into a narrower focus, a letterbox, if you will, rather than a full door. And there's times you'd give anything to get the full experience of the high back. And can the high just happen without any reason? Oh, yeah. The, the episodes do just happen without reasons quite often. So it's not as if you're enjoying something and you get a better high. It's, it's you get a high and that's mm -hmm. it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Like I've gone, mm, my last type of medical episode, I think it's something like 50 hours without sleep. Just couldn't sleep, didn't want to sleep. Too busy moving furniture, back and bones at four in the morning. You also say and do inappropriate things that you regret afterwards because well, your judgment is impaired with a high. What do you mean? Well, everyone's different, but you have no internal filter when you have a high. Your brain and your mouth just connect without filter, and you say things and do things. Your uh, insecurities go, your um, damaged self-confidence goes. Suddenly you're the most important person in the room and you don't understand why everyone is thinking and moving so slowly because you are going super fast. So in other words, your bipolar affects the people around you. Oh, absolutely. And your family. Mm-hmm. In both a good and a bad way. Yeah. But having said that, since the diagnosis, I have been given medication, which greatly helps, and I've learned a lot of coping tools. And before you got the medication and got diagnosed, did you uh, did it strain relationships? I lost friends. Yeah. Um, I've been with my husband since I was still at school. He obviously is still with me. That's great. But uh, friends, I've lost a lot of friends. They like, just couldn't handle it, and that's fair enough. They needed to do what was right for them. I, I often say about mental illness that there is a stupidity among the general population, and I stand over that in terms of, you know, if someone falls down in the street and we're taking a heart attack, you would stand around them and you would help them and you would care about them and nobody would look at that person and say, well, that's their fault. You know, damn them, get out of my way, you're blocking the street. And yet with mental illness, it, you know, the heart is an organ and the brain is an organ and with mental illness somehow, a lot of people don't understand. Mm -hmm. like some people, you know, have, we, we know of the cases over recent years where some allegedly intelligent celebrities have been, have been saying, it doesn't even exist. Yeah. Depression, it's a, a mm -hmm. designer disease, not this kind of. It happens. What do you say to those people who, who wonder whether it's a real illness? Walk a mile in my shoes and feel the blisters. That's what the book's all about. Read. Reading this has opened a lot of people's eyes. They go, oh my goodness. When I say I'm depressed, people think I'm on, if I level numbers, you know, they would say I'm on a level one or two. And I'm like a ten. You know, it's that much of a difference in scale, or beyond it even. They don't understand the language of depression. They don't understand the language of hypomania, because obviously it's even more alien to them. So when you try to express yourself, you're not fully helped because you're not fully understood. So the book, because it's journal entries spanning a lot of years, takes you from a teenager's thought process right through to an adult thought process. And you're donating proceeds of this book, Diary of a Bipolar Survivor by Lynn Fogarty. You're donating the proceeds to uh, the Samaritans because of how they helped you over yep. the years. specifically the Craig Avon branch of the Samaritans. They are coming up on their 40th anniversary and I've been using their services for 33, 34 years of that. So they have been a big part of my life. Are you better now? Can you ever get better? There is no cure. Yet. Like all things, there, there is hope that they may find a cure. But no, I don't think in terms of cure anymore. I think in terms of recovery. I have learnt <clears throat> over the past couple of years how to tease my identity away from the illness. They're not a mixed up ball anymore. I know who I am. I know where I'm going. I know what I want to do. And yeah, the illness is tagging along for the ride. But let's welcome to do that. I've got ways of dealing with it now. And I've got good support structure around me. You happy? I am. You've survived. Yeah. Which is taking a lot of strength. Yeah, because a lot of people do feel victimized by their illness. And I did in the early years as well, but not anymore. I've got a lot of support. I mean, the the Southern Trust has a mental health forum. I've been with them now a couple of years, well, a year and a half, and they've been really supportive. 
before this morning, when was the first time you were in public transport? About 20 years ago. 20 years ago. Why? Uh, severe panic attacks. I suffer from social anxiety and to do something like that on my own, get to the right platform, get on the right train. Sounds all very trivial to people who do it day in and day out, but these anxiety issues can be overpowering. It can really, really be damaging to your whole lifestyle. And so 20 years since you go on public transport, mm -hmm. you're sitting in front of me in our Belfast city centre radio studio now. How did you get here today? On the train. Your first time on public transport yeah. came here. What was it like? <laughs> It was fun. I did have a little panic attack, but luckily everybody around me was so busy with their own life they didn't notice. <laughs> um, thank you so much for making such an effort to come here today. Oh, no problem. I really enjoyed it. And thank you for getting on that train. Uh, because it's not a, uh, just about getting here, is it? It's about that you are one of the people, I repeat again, who certainly I admire and many others will. Because you're standing up very tall, you're saying this is who I am, and your story will help many other people. So thank you for making the journey today. Thank you. Lovely, lovely lady and a, a very important story uh, to tell. Uh, her book is called The Bipolar Survivor, uh, if you're interested in that. And that, that will be a, uh, a Lean Forward East uh, story will be uh, on a podcast after the show today.